Hello to everybody who's watching. Hope you're well. My name is Kemi Adeyemi, and I'm an assistant professor of gender, women, and sexuality studies at the University of Washington in Seattle, where I also direct the Black Embodiment Studio, an arts writing incubator and public lecture series dedicated to building discourse around contemporary Black art. Today, I'm excited to introduce the artist Catherine Simone Reynolds in honor of the occasion of her solo show, a Warning Resting in the Distance, which is on view at the Jacob Lawrence Gallery from November 16 to December 11, 2021. This exhibition is centered on how Black women feel in the face of danger, whether that danger is known for certain or merely speculated. Featuring photography, video, installation, and sound works, the exhibition considers how different kinds of information influence the way we relate to our surroundings. I've had the pleasure of being in conversation with Catherine leading up to and throughout this exhibition, and it is my pleasure to introduce her today. She's gonna to give a talk about her practice, um, and after she and I are gonna be in conversation in a kind of abbreviated Q&A session. But before we get there, uh, Catherine's bio. Slippage, anti-articulation, anti overhealing. Catherine Simone Reynolds' practice investigates emotional dialects and psychogeographies of Blackness within the non and the importance of anti-excellence. Her work physicalizes emotions and experiences by constructing pieces that include portrait photography, video works, choreography, and sculpture. In the process of making subtle changes uh, to her practice, she has learned that creating an environment built on intention brings the most disarming feelings to the work. Utilizing Black embodiment and affect alongside her own personal narrative as a place of departure has made her question her own navigation of ownership, inclusion, and authenticity within a contemporary gaze. She draws inspiration from Black glamour while interrogating the notion of authentic care. Her practice generally deals in Blackness from her own perspective, and she continuously searches for what it means to produce Black work. Reynolds has exhibited and performed within many spaces and institutions, including the Pulitzer Arts Foundation, Museum of Modern Art New York, The Luminary, and this current exhibition that's on view at the Jacob Lawrence Gallery. She's exhibited in national and international group and solo shows, has spoken at the Contemporary Art Museum of St. Louis and the St. Louis Art Museum and the Black Midwest Initiative Symposium at the University of Minnesota. Alongside her visual art practice, she has embarked on curatorial projects at the Luminary in St. Louis Sculpture Center and in upcoming uh, exhibitions for the Stanley Museum of Art, as well as the Clifford Still Museum for 2023 and 2024. Welcome to Catherine. Thank you for all of the work that you do. I'm looking forward to learning even more about your practice and being in conversation with you after your talk. I'll hand it over. Thank you so much, Kimmy. All right, I'll go ahead and share my screen. All right, um, so let's get into my practice real quick. Um, so real quick, I've been really looking at this um, essay by Tina Camp, I'm called Listening to Images. And this passage in particular um, really um, stood out to me as far as what it meant to will not just listen to images, but also to feel the images as well. And like what that feeling is, or as Cindy Camp likes to say, the stasis, um, or this, this musculature tension, this muscular tension um, within images and like how that um, can make you feel. And so I'll give you a minute just to read this over. And it says, widening our view beyond their faces, we witness a visual enactment of the tension Scott citing Fanon um, invokes. Women with jaws clenched, brows tensed, lips pursed, and nostrils flared in muscular, muscular tension. Scott refers to an arrested activity held back by a restraint on the edge of a new consciousness. It is a consciousness that, re that readies itself to direct the body in activity, an attention indicative of what he describes as a reservoir of resistance to the colonizer's acts of subjugation and enslavement. 
These photos visualize a similarly tense set of relations, taut skin stretched over engaged musculature, tight, tightly pursed lips, a horizontal indication or indention, indentation um, between cheekbone and jaw. These are not poses or expressions of relaxation, comfort, or ease. The tensions Im imaged in, um, in these portraits denote a state of being and becoming I describe with a different vocabulary. I call it stasis. What changes in our apprehension of these women's images and their communities were bro more broadly. When we move beyond stillness and immobility and engage them through the lens of stasis. Stasis or an act or condition of standing or stopping, a state of balance or equilibrium among uh, various forces. And stasis, which is uh, Tina Camp's definition, is tensions produced by holding a complex set of forces in suspension. In uh, invisible, um, unvisible motion held intense suspension or temporary equilibrium or vibration. So thinking of the frequency or vibration within these images. Um, next, we have one of the first photos um, that I really started to explore um, for this, like, um, like what it meant to be in a space that you're supposed to be in or supposed to be in, where all of the products on the shelf, so the beauty supply store, where all the products look like you, the mannequins are trying to look like you, and then you also have the heavily surveyed space. Um, and so within these the space of um, heavy surveillance where everything looks like you, how do you actually um, act or react or do you just, um, or do you just stay there? <laughs> and I think there is this, um, just to go back to the word stasis, I think there is this relationship to just comfortability within this, this um, that tension that then produces, um, I don't know, this, this relationship to always being uncomfortable, so the comfortability of, of discomfort. Um, and so from this image, you see the, um, the camera, and then you also have the, <clears throat> the mannequin heads, which are actually wig heads, and um, these bare shelves. And this was taken in St. Louis and I believe 2019 or 2018. Next, you have another beauty supply surveillance image. Um, and this was taken in Chicago in 2020 or 2019. Um, and once again, like you see this um, camera as well as all of this product on the walls um, that are supposed to be for you or for black women. And when I say for you, I'm, I'm actually saying for black women. And, um, and just walking into the store, it's like smile, you're on camera. And then if you look closely um, through all of, all of the products, you'll see um, a line of, um, you'll see a line of, of, of pictures that, that this camera has taken of black women and the store owners have, have placed um, for people to prominently for people to see, not necessarily these women's faces, because you actually can't see like who this is, but you know that it's, it's you. And so it's this, this odd relationship to not seeing the face, but knowing that it's you who they're looking for and looking at. And so this like, um, yeah, this like who is actually supposed to be in here <laughs> is really the question and how it's, it automatically um, instills this, this feeling of distrust of the space, but yet you know that you have to go here in order to like maintain, you know, your hair, maintain your body, you know, as black women. Um, and then getting more into like looking at being seen the gaze. Um, I started looking at this old, um, this older uh, interview of Donna Summer. Um, I believe it was in like the seventies, like the late seventies and, um, it's around the time where she either was about to commit suicide or right after, shortly after. And you can see this welling of tears in her eyes as like the interviewer is interviewing her, but like they just don't really pay attention to this, this holding of a cry that she's having to do. And that's where this image comes from. This, the eye image comes from is from that interview and trying to get as close to like where her eyes were welling up with tears without it being solely about the tear, like also it being about the way that she was looking. Um, 
and still having to give this interview and still having to like um, put on this mask of like how she was feeling and how she was doing, which goes back into a lot of my other earlier work, like um, the series, Ask Her How She's Doing, when a lot of people don't really ask black women how we really are. And, and then going into like how we really are, who we even really are, going back into the beauty supply, um, I started collecting these Michelle Obama bags, which actually one of them is in the exhibition um, in, in, um, at the Jacob Lawrence Gallery. And it was who, once again, like the question of like, who was actually supposed to be comfortable in these spaces. And the Michelle Obama of the Michelle Obama bags was the most comfortable like thing or, or person within these spaces. And um, these bags are, are actually like not really cheap. Like they're really actually really nicely made quality. And um, I found them in this beauty supply store in St. Louis <clears throat> um, where there's a lot of gospel music playing. And also you can't take your photo inside the space. Like you can't take any selfies, no selfies of yourself with any of the wigs on. Um, and uh, you can only try on, I believe, three wigs, and then like you can't try on any more. So it's this heavily policed area of, of Black women, and yet you have Michelle Obama or the Obamas like prominently like in this in this space, like right when you walk into the beauty supply store, and it was just, and they're also um, tied down with zip ties, and this once again this like this air of distrust, uh, automatic distrust, all these things seem to be for me. Even Michelle Obama is there, like who is, you know, an icon and, and someone that always tells me that I can do these things. So it's, it creates a lot of language that like, you know, a lot of, um, we're, um, a lot of confusion, disillusionment, like as far as like progress of black, of black women. And so I started to use these Michelle Obama bags and a lot of, and like some of the installational work that I've been, I've been making. Um, this is a selfie and also kind of a still um, from the, um, from the video, one of the videos from uh, the Jacob Lawrence show. And um, this was taken in Stuttgart, Germany. Um, in 2018 and I was on a residency and I was just feeling not necessarily alone but just like <laughs> so so different that like I had to kind of document this difference that I was feeling within the architecture of the the interior architecture of the space and wanting to get as many sides of me as I possibly could, but like not with like more mirrors or more gazes, but more so of like other versions of, or other things that I, I do or that I need. And so having these beauty, uh, beauty products like on the, on the shelf, like the shame moisture, like things that I need for, to maintain me. So it started to also get into this relationship between self-care and self-maintenance that I, I talk a lot about, like in my, in my practice and knowing the difference because not to get like just astrological, but like as me as a Taurus, <laughs> me as a Taurus, like I just really can really get into the self-care like and like by self-care it's like you know a, a lot of eating things that I probably shouldn't eat at that time like a lot of like luxurious pleasure and that's not always about how to maintain like me and my happiness or like maintain the like the the way that I can I can navigate the world and navigate um my passions and like my career in a healthy manner. And so I had to really start thinking about this difference and also just knowing like the way that self-care has been, you know, completely like um, monetized, like, you know, and so everything is caring and that's not necessarily true. And so, yeah, so I started to get more into that kind of um, language from, from this photo. And I actually took this from my phone. So I'm also looking, whenever you see like myself looking at my phone and it's also an image or a video, generally I'm looking at myself taking the photo. So that's how I've been able to like work with this. Cause like there's an app on my phone where I can see um, what I'm looking at from my camera and I don't necessarily have to be behind my camera. And so it is this, this relationship to how I also want to be viewed. 
Um, yeah. And this is actually, um, yeah, I couldn't use my phone for this one. So these are, <laughs> these are like how I used to take uh, self portraits back in the day. And, but it is this, it's still like utilizing like um, uh, this, this need to be seen a certain kind of way. And by that certain kind of way, not necessarily wanting to show everything, which I, I kind of get into, especially with this relationship between like um, uh, disappearing and um, not evaporating, but this, what, what does it mean to disappear completely? And I started to kind of think about that a lot. Um, and behind me, the backdrop are actually the, a, a crushed bouquet of um, hydrangeas. And so hydrangeas do this thing like where um, when you cut them and place them directly into water immediately, they, um, they, they will pretend to wilt or fake wilt and are playing possum. And because actually they're suffocating because there's a sap, a protective sap that happens um, whenever you cut it. And so it's actually cutting off the water and it's not able to, or cutting off its ability to take in water. And so it wilts because of that. And so it has to actually go through this kind of traumatic process of being dipped into hot or boiling water and then put it put back into water immediately and then it will take the water. Or you can even use, I believe it's called allium. Um, you can cut the stems and then boil it and then put allium on it and then it won't, it won't it'll prevent it from trying to self-protect. But it goes through this process just for like other, for us to see that it's blooming. And I really enjoyed the poetics around that. And so I, I've been really kind of obsessed with hydrangeas. Um, and also just knowing that like they're proper, like the way that they, if they're planted in a certain kind of soil, they change color based off of the pH. And, and I just found them to be really interesting. And so I wanted to use that as the backdrop for this this photograph or the self portrait that I took where I'm also covering my face with privacy um, acrylic. I work with a lot of privacy glass and privacy acrylic in my practice. Um, once again, like wanting not to be seen fully. Um, and I, um, and, and, and it's actually cut, uh, uh, it's actually cut into the shape of a church fan. Um, because I found that that's actually like the perfect, like <laughs> the perfect um, kind of like mask, like masquerade mask feeling that I that I wanted from for this portrait. But um, I started to kind of have this like aversion to getting my photo taken because I um, I was scared of where it was going to go. And not having like full um, control over my image was something that like started to really um, bother me. And so I, I wanted to actually figure out a way to use these like a little bit in real life, but um, that's kind of ridiculous. But but what does it mean to really document this like a version that I that I clearly am feeling and to lean more into that as opposed to a way. And so now we can come to the exhibition. Um, I'm gonna talk about a couple of the works real quick. So um, A Warning Resting in the Distance, like the title, um, the title actually comes from, well, actually let's talk about the color first. So the color, which is Dusty Rose, um, was I thought that it was this other color called Rose Matter. And I thought that Rose Matter was more so like this, but Rose Matter is a little bit more vibrant. And, but it's based off of the Stephen King novel called Rose Matter that I read as a kid where this woman, um, um, she was in an abusive relationship and she escapes um, this abusive relationship um, to the Midwest, oddly. And she's trying to live her life. She tries to pawn her ring. And um, instead of pawning it, she sees this painting and she wants this painting and so she does a switch and so, or a trade. And so she hangs the painting up in her new place and she notices that the subject keeps changing where, the, where it is positioned in the, in the painting. And so it, with her curiosity, she ends up like inside this painting somehow and then having to like go on all these odd horrific adventure or adventure, <laughs> horrific adventures. Um, uh, to find this this baby of this person or not person but this um anyway <laughs> um 
she goes on all these like um she goes on a journey in order to figure herself out and to also escape her ex-husband her ex-husband who ends up like following her into this painting all of that is to say I was really interested in the subject changing where it was within the painting and then her falling into it and I I really enjoyed that and I wanted the color of the exhibition to be rose matter but actually it's dusty rose um and with but with this like changing of the subject like in the painting where it was and and that kind of like fugitivity within this the subject, but also fugitivity within the main character and Rose Matter. I started reading more and more um, essays and and books that kind of pertain to this. But like I, I read Anne Petrie's The Street, um, as well as um, um, Incidents in the Life of the Slave Girls Told by Herself, and this relationship to fugitivity as well as par the paradoxical spaces that these women would would find themselves in was it was interesting to me and so this warning that would always kind of happen or someone would give advice and they would either heed the warning or not and all these warnings would be like resting somewhere or wanting to rest within these women and but it seemed so far away or even like you know, I always, I also describe this as like a West Texas landscape and um, seeing the the storm in, in the distance and knowing that it will actually reach you at some point. Um, and so we can get into a couple of the works, which I believe the first one we're gonna get into is this one of that, my friend, my high school friend, Dinesha Bonner, um, and she is in a Dollar Tree and, um, um, I wonder if it's, there we go, sorry. Yeah, she's um, in a Dollar Tree in St. Louis and I took this in um, 20, barely in 2018, uh, the beginning of 2018. And um, I remember talking to one of my friends, this is actually a part of a series called um, I Told You I'm Fine, which I showed at Sculpture Center, a part of the In Practice program for 2018. And um, I wanted to, um, I worked with three um, black women in St. Louis who all donned these like um, blonde wigs. And that kind of came from this conversation that I had with one of my friends who um, was saying how it seems like a warning whenever a black woman has on a blonde wig and she's another black woman and like it. And she was just saying how it seems like we have to save her. Like it, and I, and I always kind of, um, not laughed about that. I found it really interesting because it is this like clear relationship to not being black and not just black, but like not being black American. And, and I, and I, but it is at the same time, especially like this blonde of, of hair. I feel like I always just think of like black women with long blonde wigs or braids or something like that. And so it was interesting to hear her say that it's, it kind of acts as this warning for her. And so I, I, I did this whole series called I Told You I'm Fine, which was also a video series. And um, this, was, this is the one that I took of um, Dinesha in the Dollar Tree. And yeah. Next, we have um, the photo. This is a scan photo of my mother in her wedding dress uh, the day that she married my father. And um, this is actually a wedding dress that my, my grandmother made for her. And my, I believe my grandmother also took this photo. And my parents ended up getting divorced um, five years, six years later. And um, yeah, and I, I always like, listened whenever my mom would tell me like when I was started dating um and how I had to look at red flags within relationships and so this photo knowing that my mother like divorced my father and and what it means for my grandmother to also like make this wedding dress and for her to take this photo as documentation of this day and um and how you can't see my mother's face also within this, as well as um, Dinesha's face too. 
And um, so both of these women are turned away from the camera. Dinesha's hair also works as a veil in my, in how I'm, I'm wanting to pair these two. And yeah, and so just knowing that this, that this photo really of my mother was the one that I was really thinking a lot about the title for like a warning resting in, in, a, in the distance because there were, there were red flags according to my mother as far as like why like she knew not just on this day, but like she knew that like the, the relationship wasn't going to last. Um, yeah. Um, and here's the photo of my mother and then we can get into the sculptural piece on the floor. Um, so I, I, this piece, which came actually the day of the exhibition, um, because I, I made an extra piece just in case one of my molds didn't turn out and that's what happened, so it's okay. Um, there's no mystery here <laughs> um, as far as how things, the process works. And so um, this was this was a, a mold of, of, the, of one of the bowls that um, we had. And so I just placed um, some of the costume jewelry inside of the bowl. And then the mixture is actually bo um, bovine gelatin, glycerin, and, um, and uh, bovine gelatin, glycerin, and molasses. And so that's what makes the color brown. And it doesn't start out this way. This is actually after, I believe, like two weeks. And so you can see that the, the costume jewelry like starts to rise and, and almost like pulls away from the actual, um, like the actual mold, which is interesting to me because that's kind of this, this rejecting, like that happens, like if your body, if you get a piercing and your body rejects, like the, the, the piercing and it, and it pushes it out of the skin, um, which I, I didn't necessarily know was going to happen from this piece, but I do enjoy the process. And, um, yeah, I do enjoy the process. And then you have the, these like debutante, I'm thinking of them as debutante gloves underneath. And, and um, this, the sculpture is like kind of holding that down. And I kind of look at these debutante gloves and how my mother pledged, or not pledged, but um, she did this like cotillion for AKA. And so I've always been interested in that kind of like, um, like the different, the different um, socioeconomic classes of like of black women. And so this costume, this like costume jewelry that is also slightly tarnished, um, holding down these like debutante gloves and how that kind of makes me feel um, in relationship to, I guess, like my own perceptions of black womanhood. And then next we're gonna get into the display case piece, which is on the left. And this is a different photo of it, but I wanted to get a closer photo um, of this piece. So it is meant to be opened and stayed open. And um, you have a picture inside of the display case that is also obstructed by, you can't look at it straight on, you have to, the audience member has to actually move their body in order to really see what's inside. But then it it makes this, it makes this like <laughs> this relationship to where the audience has to um, is going to feel implicated in the process of seeing this black woman as opposed to it just being given to them. Um, and so I have a dance background, and so I do think a lot about how. Um, people actually physically move through the space. And knowing that I want people to have to like lay, well, lay down or, um, which happened actually, we can get into that a little bit, um, lay down, squat down, look around, like physically do things in the space in order for us all to be doing some form of labor as opposed to it just being me or them even, you know? I want it to be a, a real working relationship in, within the exhibition, even if I'm not necessarily present. And I think making this piece, I made this piece um, during grad school um, 
in uh, 2000 this year, <laughs> uh, 2021. And yeah, it's a display case and it has the keys in. So, um, and it is supposed to be open just like that, just a jar for you to look inside and see this pornographic image of a black woman um, who's also smiling and looking at you. That also has a passage that says that she wants to meet you. And so, yeah, it, it is this, um, this need, what is this need that, or I'm questioning what the need is to see black women and black women being on display and, and it also being necessarily an open invitation, but it is something that, um, Hmm. It is something that I, as a photo maker and also using photos a lot in my practice, photo-based work in my practice, like it's something that I constantly think of, which goes back into referencing the Tina Camp passage and and this, this tension, like what does it mean to see the tension even if she's not necessarily tense? Um, while also like respecting her and her space and her practice and why she is in this photo. It's another angle in it. And going back into um, images of Black women, this I found um, these four images um, in LA actually, and um, and I, I don't know who this person is at all, and wanting to still um, wanting to also speak to that of like working with images that I don't necessarily know. Who the person is and and still wanting to not just use the image but also put puts put like put something in that problematizes the use of these kinds of images and knowing that one image is is clear and the other one is a a, a double of like how um like you can see her in one frame and then in the next frame, she's different. And the book that she's holding says success in spelling. And um, there's, this, there's this need for me and a lot of uh, marginalized, but especially a lot of black female artists, like where we really want people to understand. And I know that I, maybe I'm speaking for me, so maybe I'll just speak for me, but this need to, be understood and that like that need to be like not necessarily articulate in how you're speaking but also articulate in how you're speaking um goes into this like need to also be legible and i i want to play with this like illegibility you know of the of these two image of these two images of these four images or of these five images if you think of the one on the the right, the image on the right as being two images instead. And so um, not knowing really how to place something in a space and what that, or in having a lot of different ways to place something in the space, um, but still wanting to quote unquote get it right, you know? And so I think that these, these four or five images right here um, really, it, it, it confuses me sometimes and it's hard for me to articulate why they are in the exhibition, but I also think that that's fine. And here's one of the Michelle Obama bags, which I mentioned earlier. Um, yeah, and, and, and why it's in the exhibition, but all these different versions of black women, um, even if it is something like a purse or you know a different kind of media. Um, that's why it's in the exhibition. And um, here we have one of the keloid scars, um, keloid sculptures, which if you don't know what a keloid is, we'll get into that in a second. Um, but this is one of the keloids that is similar to the bowl, um, the bowl mold. And um, 
it, the jewelry is popping out, it's coming out, it's coming through. Um, but it's also kind of scabbing over, which I do really enjoy the language around that too. And this was made in the same process. So um, yes, yeah, so molasses, bovine, bovine gelatin and uh, glycerin. And this is a keloid. So um, I've been thinking a lot about, um, I've been thinking a lot about this, once again, the concept around self, well, first started with like the self-care and the maintenance around the self-maintenance, um, which then was like a lot about my beauty, like my skincare regimen. Um, and I started thinking a lot about black skin um, in grad school and, and then I started thinking about my skin in particular, like hyperpigmentation, um, as well as like um, with a lot of black people, like I'm, I'm really moly, like I have moles and I used to have moles in the back of my ear. And so I started thinking about these moles that I had removed when I was a child and I had them removed because kids were making fun of me. And so I was just thinking a lot about like, how black skin just also has to, like we know this has to navigate the world, but knowing that there's really not a lot of um, research that has been done about black skin in particular, like things like hyperpigmentation or keloids, which also happen um, primarily within higher melanated skin tones and how keloids actually like, they are kind of like moles, except you, even if you get them removed, they will still grow back and sometimes even larger. And so this, this skin trauma or, um, you know, keloid or hypertrophic scar tissue scarring. And so that means that your skin cells are, are healing on top of each other over and over and over again. And so I started thinking about what is like, what is this concept of like about, the, or what is this concept called over healing really about? And like, how can I attribute this to, um, like me as a black woman and how I navigate the world and how it is this kind of like, not necessarily constant reminder, but it is this constant reopening, like wounding and then in even, you know, this wounding or, or um, you know, this, uh, this wounding or even like this, this, the opening up of the wound that keeps happening and happening and happening, but doesn't necessarily get wider, but it does get, grow bigger and, but it's trying to still heal itself. Um, and how that really can be attributed to like, not attributed to, well, of course attributed to, um, how that can be attributed to just the way that we are seen in the world and how we have to navigate the world. Um, and it can be, and it is such a violent world to have to navigate. And then this is the mold that I um, created. It's not of that one, um, but I created one from, or created them from a CNC machine and at school. And then this is like one of the um, inspirations as far as like kind of where I was going, wanting to go with it. Um, which is an aspic, um, which used to be like this weird savory dish in, from like the 70s um, that you would put meat and stuff in. So I was, I was really, I was inspired for a really long time about that. And then um, real quick, actually, I wanna go back to the exhibition. Oh, didn't talk about the videos, which is okay. Um, we'll talk about the videos real quick, sorry. <laughs> Um, so the video work, um, I guess I accidentally skipped the slide. Um, the videos that I did is, is, yeah, is exactly, it's about this aloneness in public, um, that I've been discussing and, and these are all portraits of me. They're not of different people. Whenever people talk to me about these, they always think that it's someone else, but it's actually me. And so it once again goes into this, like, like, what does it mean to con to be a shapeshifter, even if I, I see myself as me? Um, and which is why I also wanted, I used costume jewelry um, for the um, for the molds. And, and so, yeah, like, what does it mean to, for me to see this and know that it's me, but actually other people think that it's someone else. Um, and two of the videos were, um, 
or no, three of the videos are from overseas and one is from um, here in Chicago. I also really quickly wanted to go back into this room, um, which is where my mother's voice is also speaking um, about black space and what does it mean for people to navigate black space? Um, and what, is it, what does black space feel like and how do you know that you're in one? Um, and so, yeah. And I'm really grateful that I got to work with her in multiple ways. And just to end, um, for future, I'm thinking, um, this is a um, an old nightclub in East St. Louis. And I've been thinking more and more about the concept of overhealing when it pertains to a Midwestern landscape, and especially when it pertains to St. Louis and or even um, post-industrial Midwestern landscapes. And so yeah, I've been I've been having questions around um, around Black navigation, uh, Black imagination, also when it comes to spaces. And um, yeah, I think that's really about it. So um, thank you so much <laughs> for listening to my, my, um, my talk or my meanderings of, of language. So thank you. Yay. not meanderings at all. Thank you so much for sharing your practice with us. Uh, very insightful. You know, I, I have the great fortune of having been able to be in the exhibition a warning resting in the distance um, and to kind of wander through that space. And so watching you kind of talk through some of the decisions you made um, just really illuminated a lot of um, a lot of the work in a, in a new kind of way for me, which I appreciate. And kind of on that note, I wanted to start with the first question, just sort of asking you to reflect on some of the installation decisions you made. Uh, as we could see in some of the images that you were showing, you do, uh, I, I think, a really great work uh, job of creating a lot of space in the exhibition. Um, there's this sense at the one hand that um, I think spare is the wrong word, because spare sort of suggests like a lack of, you know, content. Uh, so that's not what's happening. But I, I think that language of like, you really do create a lot of space and, and how, and the way that you've created a lot of space makes the space feel really full and really rich. So I'm just curious to hear you talk about um, not only the selection of work that you wanted to be on view, but how you positioned it on the walls and, and how you, uh, especially in that first room, the decisions you made to to put them in conversation spatially uh, in a certain kind of way. Oh, I mean, I was like I talked to you about how I was like really nervous. <laughs> I was really nervous about um because I'm I'm usually more of a more is more curator. Like I really like to have things on the wall. I like people to I always thought that it was more so about um yeah like how like like saturation I was really into saturation so I this show is still saturated but it's because of the color that it feels as full as it does because the color itself is still operating in some kind of like capacity as like a work and um but I knew I wanted to place the two photos like my of my mother and of Dinesha together because of the veil and um and and I and I wanted to kind of keep the first room a little very like very open because I knew that my mother's voice would also be there and I wanted her voice to really impact people in the room instead of it being something for people just to walk through really quickly. And so I think that I really wanted to place a lot of, um, I wanted to place everything intentionally, not to say that I, I usually don't, but everything had to be placed intentionally in order for people to not just think that it was nothing there. Um, so yeah, this is the first show that I did like this and I find it, it was really, it was really um, complicated. It was more complicated than it usually is um, because I had to really, choose how people would would walk the space as I said in, in the talk like I knew that people would 
would ha would be doing like you know a, a bend down you know after looking around bending down someone laid down in the gallery at one point Emily said and like listened to my mother and so also creating space for that to happen too um which I didn't really think about but I'm glad it can happen in that kind of way um and then also having space for people to look around into the um the display case piece yeah as somebody who is a little familiar with your work I think that this exhibition feels like a kind of transition point in your practice um and without over determining what that looks like to you I, I kind of want you to respond to that prompt like are there ways that you feel like this exhibition or this period this time period of your practice uh, that there's a change happening um, in, in the way you approach um, image making, in the way you approach object making, in the way you approach installation? No, definitely. I mean, I think this exhibition really made me confront a lot of things that I have been scared of. Like, as I was talking about with um, just using images, to be honest, like I was really scared to use images of Black women for a little bit because I was just kind of like, if it's not of me, then I, I really don't want to take the photos anymore. And so working with or using the photo of Dinesha um, that I took of her kind of made me lean into that fear as well as using a very personal photo of my mother really made me lean into like, you know, it, even though everybody, everybody, I shouldn't say that, even though I always say that, like, you know, this was a very personal exhibition, this was a very, like, this was really, like, a, like, I got something out, like, I really actually use this space as, as, um, as a diary entry that I've never really done before, and, um, and also, like, implicated myself within things, you know, and so I think that, I wasn't just trying to put a show together to show that I can like do something. It was more so of me putting a show together to like, you know, have not like maybe like even like a workshop or like lab or like talk about things with people because I am also questioning this. Um, and so wanting to promote more questions as opposed to just like you have, a, you had a show and I, and I really appreciate like, a lot of, well, I appreciate having the time and the invitation because it wouldn't have happened without that. One of the things that you said uh, early in the talk, uh, you, you talked about your relationship to portraiture and having a kind of aversion to yourself being photographed and that kind of informing the decisions that you're making around taking images of other people like you just reflected on. Um, I'm wondering what your relationship to portraiture is. Um, and, and I think a related question might be like, to what extent do you kind of consider yourself a photographer, like a capital P photographer? You know, you're also working um, really sort of institutionally like with sculpture in ways that are evident in this exhibition, but I'm not sure if you kind of consider yourself a sculptor or, you know, so it's a kind of twinned question of, what is your relationship to portraiture as like a, a field, as a, especially an, an especially important field uh, for contemporary Black artists? And how does that play into the ways that you might be identifying yourself um, with other mediums and other practices, for example, or, for example, sculpture? That's a good question. Um, thanks. Um, I hmm. see like I, <laughs> I've always seen myself as a dancer like I've always seen myself as like I, I would claim that I was a dancer like I was like for years I was like I'm a dancer like I dance I'm a dancer but um and then I would also claim you know for years I claimed I was a photographer I never have claimed that I was a sculptor but I use sculpture um I you know I I never claimed that I was a videographer, but I use video. Um, and now I would more so claim that I use, I, I work image-based, you know? So I, I really cannot claim that I'm a photographer anymore, even though I do use photography. Um, 
I, I don't know. I, I, I go in and out of like, you know, cause I'm also a curator and an artist. So I've always worked in like, if not duality, like definitely within multiple media. Like I've, I've always worked, worked that way. And I think it actually does stem from, um, uh, I mean, I have ADHD, but I think it also like, stems from as a as a kid like I would travel to go visit my father so I was like constantly in transit um like to other states and stuff and so I think that I've never really like I feel more comfortable when I'm in when I'm doing two or multiple things at once and I don't necessarily not not that I'm like scared to claim that I am a photographer or scared to claim that I am a sculptor I just think that it limits the way that I I think about things because I I'm more so just trying to ask like answer questions that I have or to have as I said like more conversations with people and I think that if people just came to a show and they're like oh like they're a sculptor then they're just going to expect that as opposed to someone propose like like uh, proposing an idea or just like a thought or having a question you know so kind of building off of that you ended your talk sort of briefly gesturing to some work and some ideas that are moving you forward from this point and I just want to give you more space to uh, think out loud about what feels generative uh, for you moving forward or even even indirectly indirect conversation with a warning resting in the distance at the Jacob Lawrence Gallery in the process of um, putting that show on have you were you sort of like um, were there things that you're like, okay, I want to do this differently or, you know, correction is too strong of a word, but like, were there things uh, about the process of this particular exhibition that you really want to tackle kind of head on in your next endeavors? So I think I kind of knew this was my, I've had, a, I've had a lot of solo shows. Like I've had a lot of solo shows, which I'm like really grateful for. Um, but I, I knew when I did this, like I just drove out to Seattle, like, you know, um, and I just knew it was going to be my last one for a little bit. Like I just went, I'm, I'm putting that out there because I really think that I need to take some, some more time. And that's something that I haven't really given myself. And, and I think I just, knew not even really in choosing the work but like I knew that like it was it was it would have to be different because I can't I used to always um bring more for a show um and then edit and I think it it made it's um it became this process of me not really trusting myself and like being like, like in wanting other people to like weigh in on, you know, whether or not this made sense, even though I knew it, it did. And so I had to like, because I couldn't pack up everything in the car and drive out to Seattle with everything, I had to limit what I was going to show. And, and I think in that limitation and also during that process of driving out, I was just realizing like what I need is time and space. And I think with knowing that I needed time and space, I made a show that was about space. <laughs> and, um, and, and not just talking about space, but actually was about space. And so I think that, that that's what made it different was because I went into an exhibition with what I needed. Yeah. I love that. I'm glad that you gave us those of us in Seattle, the time and space, especially if it's the last dregs for a little while. I appreciate the, <laughs> I appreciate the time. I appreciate the space and I appreciate the energy. And I'm really grateful to you for not only putting on that wonderful exhibition, but talking about it in detail with us right now. And so I just want to give my thanks to you and I appreciate you and I love all the work that you do. And um, yeah, I'm just really looking forward to what comes next for you. Oh my God. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you. Like, I, I love to hear that. Thank you. It really, 
the show was a doozy, but it was really, it was a doozy in a different kind of way. And um, I am really grateful for that space in that time, yeah. for real. Yeah. For real. For real. All right, Catherine, thank you so much. Round of applause, virtual round of applause. Um, and we'll just be seeing you 